We move on a little bit over here, guys. I'm not going to be spending too much time over here, and you know why? Because we've done this quite extensively when we looked at the various models, and we looked at multi-factor modeling. We've seen all of this before. Not too much, uh, too too much more that we can add over here. This is chapter eight. I'm sure you guys remember uh, chapter eight of uh, models. Okay, um, we've seen this all before. So there's not too much new coming out of here. Remember multi-factor models. Okay, x ante is, is forward looking, x post is backward looking. Okay, and that's why if it's an x ante model, we always talk about expected, expected premiums, expected, expected returns, x post are actual returns, actual premiums, etc. That's your big difference, guys. Don't be overly awed between when they say ex ante or ex post the key difference is is it a forward look and we're looking for expected if it's ex post it's a backward look okay and what are some of my famous models remember the, and, and the, the key to all of this guys is when we come out of this particular section be it a single factor model be it a multi-factor model makes no difference okay The key that I, that I need to take out of that is that I'm using the CAPM or I'm using Farmer French as a multi-factor model to arrive at what? A benchmark. Why do I need a benchmark? Well, I need a benchmark to be able to compare what? My actual performance to the benchmark. Then I can say, well, what was active return versus systematic return? Remember, so that's what I'm doing with all of these fancy models. We're going off to model a model. You think you're back in topic two. Okay, It's really just to be able to calculate a benchmark uh, against which I can compare my actual performance, taking you straight back to the beginning of our of our chapter over here, guys, uh, learning objective 17.1, which remember, guys, I'm just going to repeat it for you again. Okay, active return is portfolio return less benchmark. Now, benchmark is the systematic return. Active return is the idiosyncratic return. Okay. Port uh, the, the, the actual performance is my is my portfolio return. Benchmark is all is, is the is, is the key over here. If I'm using a single factor model, how do I arrive at my benchmark? I'll use CAPEP. If I'm using, if I'm trying to calculate my benchmark with a multi-factor model, oh, I can use Farmer French, I can use Carhartt, whoever I like. But it's just to calculate the benchmark or the systematic components of the return. And again, I'm not spending any time on Farmer French. We've done Farmer French in great detail. You guys know that one well from back uh, for in uh, topic two. I've even thrown in the same example for you. It, uh, if, if you did the example, guys, okay, um, in chapter eight, don't do it again. You've seen it one time before. No need for repetition over there. Okay, um, and here are my returns over there. Nothing too fancy. There we go. Carhartt model is a is a carbon copy. Then, guys, again, we've seen this all before. But the Carhartt model is a carbon copy of the Farmer French model. Other than that, it adds in a another factor called the momentum factor. Once I am done. Okay, with all my calculations, what will that be? That'll be my benchmark. So look over here, guys. When I run my whole Farmer French model, I come out with a expected return, okay, um, of 2.6%. Okay. Now, what do we call that? Well, that's the, the all of a sudden now we can just say what? There's the benchmark. I've got a benchmark. Where did I get it from? Farmer French. Any amount, any actual return, any portfolio return, call it what you wish, in excess of the benchmark is called idiosyncratic. Be it positive or be it negative. In the previous example, guys, you do remember we that was it happened to be a negative amount. Okay, there's your numbers. Okay, what bias arises from omitted factors? What happens if I leave something out? Okay, uh, in my benchmark. Okay, instead of using all the correct factors, I leave one of them out. Okay, and this is quite important. When a market is trading upwards, okay, in other words, most of the indices will outperform a, a risk-free rate. If I then leave out one of the factors, a systematic factor, this will result in me overestimating my risk-adjusted performance of what? 
of assets that are positively exposed to that factor. Okay, because that factor should have been in there, should have been accounted for, it wasn't, it was omitted, yet I've got that asset and that factor in my portfolio, which is giving me a nice positive impact. On the other side, it'll underestimate the performance of assets that are negatively exposed to the emitted factor, risk factor. Okay, of course, in a down market, the, the effect would be reversed. Okay. Single versus multi-factor models, guys, top of H10. Okay. Um, and it, it would almost be a little bit silly for us to assume that alternative asset markets um, are only exposed to a single factor called that of the market. So obviously we would need to be working in terms of developing a benchmark. We would need to be working much more with a multi-factor model, okay, um, which would, as we say over here, provide a more robust basis for understanding and estimating the sources of return. Okay, we move on a little bit over here, guys. Okay, and we talk a little bit about the CAPM. And is the CAPM a good model to use in terms of a benchmark, or perhaps less so? We start off and, and we give the CAPM its due credit. It's a good model when used to model traditional investments, limited use for alternative. And why does it have limited use within an alternative asset space? Number one, alternative assets they exhibit non-normal returns. And where, where do we see that, guys? Excess kurtosis and skewness. Alternative investments exhibit non-stationarity, and CAPM insists on stationarity, in other words, uh, means and variances remain the same over time. Not so, of course, for alternatives. Alternative assets are illiquid, and CAPM wants assets to be liquid. Okay, Investor-specific assets or liability. Okay, um, Certain institutions, okay, uh, institutional investors possess certain assets that may not be optimally hedged or diversified, uh, as the CAPM would perhaps like them to be. Okay, and remember guys, of course, CAPM is a single period model. Not everybody works only on a one period um, of asset investment. We move down over here, okay, 17.5, and this is where you can take your, those that uh, are not overly excited to have too much extra information thrown, in, thrown at them because there is so much anyway. You can take your black pen here and you can start to cross a little bit, okay. Um, we look at, uh, mainly we're looking at benchmarking because now what we're going to do guys, if we just give a bit of context to what we've seen so far, all that we've really done is we've spoken a little bit about benchmarks. Okay, in the initial uh, learning objective we spoke about benchmarks, we spoke about active return and we even introduced Bailey into the picture and when we spoke about Bailey we spoke about the different criteria for a good benchmark. Then we said nothing really works overly well for alternatives as a benchmark, okay? But before we move specifically into alternatives, we're gonna just talk a little bit about two nicely well-known benchmarks, okay? One of them being a single factor model called the CAPM, and the other one called a multi-factor model we focus on Farmer, French, and Carhartt. Then we said, well, alternatives don't only fit into these very well, okay? Um, so we better start to think of alternative ways of getting benchmarks for alternatives. Introduce us, of course, then to 